This is going to be Chapter 2, Introduction to Emergency Medical Service Systems. And key concepts on this, we're going to talk about the paradigm shift for, uh, that EMS has shifted from pretty much an ambulance transport to providing pre advanced pre-hospital care. Uh, emergency medical services are incorporated into all levels of public life, and that would be local, state, and national. EMS agenda for the future has redefined both the scope of practice and our educational standards. The evolution of EMS, and we are a relative newcomer to the field of medicine, and we pretty much started in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, evolution of healthcare. Before the 1800s, physicians traveled by mules to deliver healthcare. In the 1800s, we got an influx of immigrants in the United States, which increased the demand for facilities. Early and mid 1900s, we had laboratory discoveries. Um, examples of this would have been uh, microscopes to identify the sources of many diseases, uh, word spread instead of by mouth through medical journals, and medical societies were created. Evolution of medicine. Public health care emerges. A hospital admission becomes public expectation. So if I'm sick and I want to go to the hospital, I expect it for the hospital to treat me. Uh, infectious diseases wane. Uh, and pretty much the infectious diseases, like uh, examples of this, following World War II, uh, we successfully introduced modern antibiotics. Uh, incidents of infectious diseases were waning, and in the 1800s we had things like smallpox uh, and epidemic-style diseases, and all of that we were kind of figuring out what caused them and giving vaccinations for them. Chronic diseases became more and more normal place, like heart disease, cancer, and things like that. Um, medical sciences and biotechnology emerged, and we ha started to have the ability to provide uh, technological assistance to our medical science. Uh, widespread health insurance costs skyrocketed during this time because it was more and more expensive. And the federal government started taking kind of a foothold on this a little bit, and they took a greater role in healthcare at that point. Uh, public healthcare. Public health movement in the 1800s results of epidemics and the results of like smallpox, yellow fever, and cholera. Uh, quarantines were pretty much in the house and confinement was used to quarantine people in their house and businesses pretty much suffered uh, due to a loss of productivity. So wealthy patrons hired graduate nurses to go to the homes and work sites and some community nurses established clinics. Public health service uh, evolved out of the need for health care from the uh, maritime fleet. Uh, roots can be traced to the creation of the Maritime Hospital Service in 1798. Uh, became the Federal Public Health Service, a key portion of the Department of Health and Human Services today. The history of emergency medical service. Uh, Romans. Romans used chariots to move battle-injured soldiers off the field. Innovation was followed by the first hammock wagon. Uh, Spanish Crusade of Ferdinand and Isabella introduced the use of ambulances. Dominic Jean Larry of Baudin, surgeon credited for the concept of the modern ambulance. And these were light carriages in this time that were used to pick up the injured and transport them to the surgeon. So kind of a first glimpse at our modern day trauma system. American Civil War. American Civil War utilized weapons of mass destruction, not the weapons that we think of today, uh, things like uh, Gatling guns and cannons and things like that. So medical intention improved. Major Jonathan Letterman recognized the military field uh, medical service and enacted something called the Letterman Plan, uh, an act to establish a uniform system of ambulances in the armies of the United States declared that ambulances were pretty much a special corps that needed personnel in distinct special uniforms who drove specially marked wagons and they had a red cross on them. The Geneva Treaty, Treaty kind of helped us with this, established the neutrality of ambulance workers who wore the red cross. The American Red Cross during this time, 1881, was formed and chartered by Congress. Uh, provide volunteer aid in time of war to the sick and wounded of the armed forces. And the American Red Cross is both active in peacetime and in wartime during this time as well. So the emergence of civilian EMS. Now, we started to get in with post-World War II, or I'm sorry, post-World War I. It's like, well, that really worked well 
in World War One, we we moved ambulances off of the battlefield, sick and wounded, but they still weren't evolved as much as today's current EMS providers are. So after World War One, we started seeing hospital-based civilian ambulance services. They appeared in the United States. Uh, citizens started to see an importance of an organized emergency medical service, and volunteer rescue squads started forming all over. Uh, first one was formed in Roanoke, Virginia. Community-based rescue squads began to spring up all across the country. And figure 2.4 here is one of those first ambulances. This is, who knows what's all in that. I'm pretty sure that this right here, if you ever wanted to see it, courtesy of the Julian Stanley Wise Foundation, they probably have this in a museum somewhere. All that stuff back in there. So this was one of the first rescue squads uh, seen here in figure 2.4. Changing paradigms. Uh, in World War II, the ambulance was chiefly seen as an expedient means to get the patient to a hospital. And that was before the implementation of something called CPR. So once CPR was developed, um, it became apparent that the ambulance drivers may be able to offer more than just a ride. Now, in that time frame, we were truly ambulance drivers probably. May have known a little first aid, but not know much more not much more than the normal soldier. So once CPR was developed, well, now we have some skills. Uh, it became apparent that drivers may offer more at this time. The American Red Cross and the American Heart Association started conducting. If we, we did it in the Army, we can sure bring this to the public. So they started conducting mass CPR training and first aid training. Well, this was all a kind of a big push. The white paper. The white paper was really called Accidental Death and Disability, A Neglected Disease of Modern Society. And in 1966, uh, pre-hospital care was pretty much not keeping pace. Highway safety reports were produced. And in this white paper, um, John F. Kennedy kind of started this and said it was one of the probably the most neglected things in health care in our country. So in 1966, Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law the National Highway Safety Act, and this created an EMS program within the Department of Transportation. Federal Department of Transportation produced the first emergency medical technician ambulance curriculum in 1969. Coronary care. Uh, physicians dealing with more and more heart attacks, and that's because we reduce the epidemics and we start to see more and more chronic disease. Uh, direct current defibrillators were produced from this. Uh, studies were shown. They shock the heart back into rhythm. Pre-hospital coronary units or heart shockers were put in the ambulance and staffed with trained coronary care nurses. Uh, survival rates were remarkable. Ohio State University starts the heart mobile. About this time, the emergency hit TV series uh, or the TV hit series emergency kind of comes into play. And this was loosely based on paramedic programs fire department paramedics or fire medics responding to a variety of emergencies. Federal legislation, the EMS Act of 1973, offered technical assistance to regions and municipalities. It delineated 15 aspects of EMS system that needed to be improved though. Federal EMS efforts in, 19, in the 1980s, in 1981, the Omnibus, Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, and this took monies previously earmarked for EMS and place them under a broader rubric or platform, if you will, of preventive health money. Uh, governments provided large blocks or grants and it turned EMS control kind of over to the states at that point. EMS agenda for the future. Suggestions. Uh, EMS will be more intimately intertwined with public health and safety and this this is true. We are going to see it more and more. We are the tip of the spear when it comes to public health, so to speak. EMS will continue to evolve along with healthcare. Public expectations and demands of EMS will remain high. And the public expects everything, and rightly so. Um, paramedics and emergency physicians are going to need to take uh, better decisions regarding what care, provi what care is actually provided and the best care for the patient's outcome. Uh, more evidence-based medicine, uh, strive to improve preparedness so that we're ready to react to whatever, and demonstrate efficiency and effectiveness in everything that we do. 
the National EMS Education Agenda for the Future. And this is figure 2.8, and these are the five essential elements of the EMS education system. And this is courtesy of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. So, the National EMS core content. Let's talk about that. It pretty much defines disorders, diseases, syndromes, and EMS provider skills. Next thing on our list here is the National EMS Scope of Practice Model. And it defines and divides EMS into four groupings. And those four groupings are EMR, or Emergency Medical Responder, EMT, or EMT Basic, Advanced EMT, or AEMT, and Paramedic. The National EMS Education Standards serves as a basis for EMS instruction. And that's this thing right here. The National EMS Education Program Accreditation assures program meets national standards. And this is what we're all kind of going through, The EMS programs and EMS education programs are accredited. The National EMS Licensure and Certification. Uh, licensure permits an individual to practice a trade or a profession. Generally, that license is issued after demonstrating or the demonstration of satisfactory completion of a course of education usually called a certification, and our National EMS certification is done through the National Registry. And let me clear this off here. So, mission of the EMS system, a fundamental mission, to respond to emergency medicine, or to respond to medical emergencies, if you will, <clears throat> uh, provide unseen care, and transport the patients. This is exemplified in the six points of the Star of Life, those six points are detection, reporting, response, on-scene care, care in transit, and then transfer to definitive care. Legislation and regulation. The states have enacted legislation, and this regulates EMS functions, and it also describes the levels of the providers within that state. Uh, links practice with State Medical Practice Act and physician oversight. And EMS is a part of the larger government response to a disaster. So if there's a disaster in in Oklahoma, then EMS is going to be involved with it or to provide the medical support. EMS communications, and these are essential. Public access, the most common means is a telephone call. 911 service is now now identifies the caller locations. And and they can even geocode you through GPS. So even for off of your cell phone at this point. Communication systems start at the public safety access point. Um, alerts public of impending danger, and this would be like the emergency broadcast system and things like that. Architecture of EMS. <clears throat> there are multiple system configurations. There are fire-based system, which that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and this is the predominant means of EMS delivery in the United States, fire-based systems. Hospital-based systems, and these are commercial ambulance services. Uh, Community-based EMS, uh, independent and or not-for-profit, largely staffed with volunteers. Uh, the lack of volunteers made them kind of turn into paid crews. Municipal EMS services emerged as government's part of safety responsibility. And then military emergency medicine. It's not on this list, but it is the largest provider of emergency medical care. Resource management. Um, pretty much involves placing vehicles and personnel into position to provide the most expeditious response to an emergency. And there's various ways of doing this. There's fixed post staffing, which is essentially an example of this. Your posts would always be here, wherever the map might be. And then there's system status management, which pretty much, due to statistical analysis, and we know where the call is forming, um, instead of having posts in that location, the ambulance would move from, there would be posts here, here, and here, static posts all over the city, but the ambulance may be moving from one location to another continuously. And that would be due to statistical analysis that in this area, over the last five years, we've had a level one call or, or whatnot. So system status management pretty much keeps the uh, keeps the ambulance running quite a bit and moves from one post to the next. And then there's peak load staffing. Let me clear this off here and I'll kind of explain that. Peak load staffing. Pretty much um, if I know that I have 
a high concentration of wrecks on the highway or I-35 or whatever interstate during the drive at 5, I'm probably going to post a couple of units pretty close to that, especially if statistically I've run six or seven calls in that area. So three ways, fixed post, system status, and then peak load. Specialization. There are all kinds of specializations out there, specialty care transport, things like um, critical care transport is a part of that. Flight paramedic, which is definitely involved also in that critical care transport. A wilderness EMT, which would be a specialist outside of the actual norms of society, so in the woods and, and things like that. Paramedic in the rural setting, and then there's the farm medic course, which kind of is involved with that. And then tactical EMS, all kinds of various specializations. Figure 2-9, a fire service-based ambulance stands ready for an EMS call. And this is figure 2-9 in your book. Information systems. And information systems incorporate information system into the patient care. And this would be like our electronic reports and our electronic documentations. And there's going to be multiple confidentiality challenges with that due to the way that the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act is kind of written. It must be secure in all forms and fashion that we don't get patient history and patient information out to a person that is not involved in the patient care. Integration of health services. EMS is a link between the public and the rest of the healthcare continuum and that's absolutely true. We're the tip of the spear on that. Most people whenever they're having a bad day will call EMS. A number of people depend on EMS. Social workers, trauma surgeons, and cardiologists to be a few of them that depend on our business to continuously bring in revenue. Medical direction and finance systems. Medical direction. And we have an actual a group here, the American College of Emergency Physicians, or ASEP, uh, and this is pretty much the principles of the EMS system. Uh, they provide pretty much medical oversight, medical command, protocols, and standing orders. Financial systems, financial financing EMS is typically driven by community capabilities, and there can be fee for service. So I charge you for the actual service that I give, Medicare uh, based, and then there's grants. Uh, grants for special projects are also available. Inconsistent funding is one of the most difficult, is one of the highest difficulties that EMS faces with this, is not getting continuous funding for, for variation, for uh, special projects or projects of any sort. Uh, national healthcare systems. The majority of the world is government operated enterprise. <clears throat> the United States is more of a medley between things. And pressures from the actual U.S. government have encouraged the concept of managed healthcare. And we have three variations of that, that the book talks about. Health maintenance organizations, or HMOs, and they provide payments to healthcare providers at a negotiated annual per capita rate. So this is kind of like group healthcare. Uh, Preferred Provider Organizations, or PPO, modify fee-for-service schedule that permits patients to choose their health care provider from a roster. So there's going to be specific doctors on a roster that you'll choose from, but that would be your preferred provider. Uh, and then point of service. Point of service is patient is allowed to... Um, Patient is allowed to choose a healthcare provider from amongst a list of preferred care providers or PCPs. They may also elect to see another out-of-system provider without a referral, and, but this is going to make them pay a substantially higher rate, and that would be point of service versus PPO versus HMO. So, conclusion on this chapter: We had very early beginnings. The hearses were the were used as ambulances in the start of things. Patients might be lucky enough to have an ambulance driver with basic first aid training. EMS has evolved into a complex system of emergency responders. Provide public with the emergency medical safety net as a part of a larger healthcare system. The references for this chapter is the Professional Paramedic Volume 1, Foundations of Paramedic Care First Edition, pages 16 through 37, or chapter 2, and that's by Delmar Learning. And if you have any questions concerning this chapter, feel free to give me a